you sent for me, Mr. Oxford? Yes, I am now ready to dictate the letter. <sighs> to... Mr. Priam Fowle. Dear Mr. Fowle, colon, as you well know, comma, it is one of the regrets of my life that I have never had the privilege of meeting you in person, comma. Although the Oxford galleries have had the honor of representing you here in England for some 10 years, full stop. I appreciate your shyness, comma. I sympathize with you deeply in your dread of the celebrity which you have gained as the most distinguished of English painters, comma. And I would not dream of intruding upon your privacy if it were not that extraordinary circumstances would seem to demand your presence here in London at the earliest possible moment, comma. As you will note from the enclosed communication from Buckingham Palace, full stop. Take it as a matter of course that you've already read this. Yes, sir. Against a bright light? No, sir, the envelope was too thick. I was compelled to steam it open over the tea kettle. Why on earth do you bother? Don't you find my letters dreadfully dull? Frightfully so, sir. They bore me. Your position is somewhat different from mine, sir. You relish this isolation. I am by nature a very sociable, even gregarious character. The existence in these suburbs of civilization with only yourself and a few anteaters for company is one that I've never been quite able to accept wholeheartedly. Oh, come now, Leek. Are you sure you've given it a fair chance? Twenty-five years, sir. Next Tuesday afternoon at 27 minutes past three. Not really. I had no idea. Asia, Africa, Australia, America. Twenty-five years. Twenty-five years of peace and solitude. And yet, Leek, under certain circumstances, I shouldn't mind seeing London again. That is fortunate, sir. If I were a complete nobody like you, or if all the art lovers of England could be exterminated overnight. As it happens, sir, the decision has already been made for you. Uh, the letter, sir, it says you're to come back to London immediately. Who says it this time? The King, sir. Oh, I'm afraid that's not for us, that world of teas and party. Who did you say? The King, sir. Enclosed in this letter from Mr. Oxford is a communication from Buckingham Palace. You are to be knighted. That's impossible. I couldn't face such a thing. Which shall I lay out for the trip, sir? Your trousers or your knickerbockers? <laughs> Terribly sorry, sir. No apologies necessary. Can't be helped. Two and six, Governor. Oh, yeah. You mind bringing those bags in, please? All, All right, right, Governor. Now. Steady now. Should have left someone in charge, I suppose. Well, I can't say I've ever been very homesick for it. Would you be good enough to call a doctor, sir? Miss Fowles' residence? Yes. Dr. Caswell. Are you alone? Of course. 
I'm sorry. Come in, please. Sorry I couldn't get here earlier. It's quite all right, I'm sure. How is he? He's quiet now. I've got him in bed. What seems to be the trouble? I don't know. We only returned to England yesterday. It was chilly on the ship, you know, after the tropics. Well, we'll have a look. Which way? Upstairs, if you don't mind. Yes, there's no doubt about it. This sea air is the most dangerous thing on Earth. Any temperature? I expect so. First thing I knew anything was wrong. He simply collapsed on the boat train from Plymouth. Here's a... Here's the doctor. Well, well, now, let's see. Quite badly off. Pneumonia. Oh, poor chap. But we'll see what we can do for him. Any women up? Women? There are no women here. Only ourselves. Then, if you'll tell me where the kitchen is... It's below. Um, a second door to the right. This is brandy. Get him to sip it. I'll be up again in half a moment. All right, my boy. Everything well in hand now. I hope so, sir, but I doubt it. Oh, nonsense. This chap's a perfect wizard. He'll have you up and about in a day. Here, sip this. Awkward time, sir, isn't it? On the very eve, as you might say, of the court ceremony. I'll probably need about a quarter of this. <coughs> oh, excuse me. I'm afraid, sir, I have a confession or two to make. Don't be a fool. Never make a confession until you actually feel rigor mortis setting in. You might recover. That's it, sir. This time I'm done for. I know it. Nevertheless, I don't want to hear it. Well, I haven't the slightest doubt that you're a first-rate scoundrel at heart. If you don't mind my saying so, you're such a shady-looking individual. I dare say this is no time to discuss your morals. Yes. You're going to get well. And I have no intention of facing a future in which you loathe me because once, in a moment of melodrama, you confessed to me that you had kissed the milliner's daughter. Yes. I'm convinced that if you put your mind to it, we can be out of here and off for Patagonia tomorrow night. You do make life sound so attractive, sir. Get some blankets quickly. He will get well, won't he? I, I need him, you know. Stop asking idiotic questions. Do what I tell you. Yes, of course. Of course. Sit down. Will there be an autopsy? There's no need. I can give a certificate. Acute double pneumonia. Sometimes happens this way. I've rarely seen one so rapid. What I'll do without him, I simply don't know. We've been together so long. There was no pain. He simply fell asleep. Thank heaven for that. Will one find Mr. Fowle's relatives? What did you say? His relatives. They have to be notified. Mr. Fowle's relatives? Yes, Mr. Fowle's relatives. Hadn't he any? Only a distant cousin, I believe. Duncan Fowle, a solicitor. They hadn't seen each other since they were boys. Do you know his address? Temple Inn, sir. I take it you were Mr. Fowle's valet. Yes, sir. What was Mr. Fowle's first name? Priam. P-R-I-A-M. Is that the Priam Fowle, the painter, who was to be knighted tomorrow? It was today, sir. Oh, by Jove. My wife won't be half thrilled over this. She's passionately fond of art and all that rot. Is she indeed? 
Hmm, pity I couldn't have pulled him through. Might have persuaded him to come to one of her teas. <laughs> They'd had a high old time together gassing over that muck. I can well imagine, sir. Dotty, wasn't he? Dotty. Cracked. Bit. On the contrary, sir, Priam Fowl was universally regarded as one of the soundest men of this or any other generation. Oh, didn't I read somewhere where he ran away from England years ago to marry a Fiji witch or something? It is far more likely, sir, that he ran away from England years ago to escape your wife. Great Scott. Did he know her? I speak, of course, sir, in hyperbole. Oh. Oh. Naturally. Naturally. <laughs> no, uh, no hard feelings, eh? None, sir. Oh. Well, I'll attend to the formalities, uh, certificate registrar, etc. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, well, this, uh, <laughs> this must be for you. Yeah. Thank you again. Oh, well, good, uh, good day, eh? Good, good day, sir. Yeah. Three Water Road, Putney. Dear Mr. Leake, I think the photograph of you is most gentlemanly, so I enclose one of mine. I am glad your gentleman has decided to come back from abroad, and I shall be pleased to meet you as you suggest. How about outside the Empire Music Hall, Saturday evening? In case the photo is too flattering, ha ha, shall wear red roses in my hat. Yours sincerely, Alice Chalice. P.S. I am a widow of ten years standing. Over. P.P.S. There are always a lot of dark spots in the Empire. I have no doubt you will behave as a gentleman should. Excuse me, I merely mentioned it in case. A.C. How do you do, Sir Basil? I'm Mr. Fowle's cousin. To the left, please. Thank you. How do you do? To the left, please. How do you do? To the left, please. Mr. Fowle? Yes. I'm Clive Oxford. How do you do, Mr. Oxford? To the left, please. Just as I would have imagined him. With all the nobility of his work in those majestic features. Gentlemen. Gentlemen, His Majesty the King. Majesty, may I present Mr. Duncan Fowle, Mr. Priam Fowle's cousin. Your Majesty, please accept my deepest sympathy, Mr. Fowle. Thank you, Your Majesty. He'll be buried in the Abbey, of course. The Abbey? Forgive me, Your Majesty. Don't you think he deserves it? Oh, of course, Your Majesty. Lake in Westminster Abbey. Did you go through those bags? Yes, sir. Nothing but his own stuff. Oh, very good. Now, in lieu of notice, I'm giving you a month's wages. It's no use. I can't go through with it. 
In addition, the will provides that the estate pay you two pounds a week for life. <laughs> An extremely handsome allowance. Now, if you will just leave your address at my office. Duncan. I beg your pardon. Don't you really recognize me? Well, it's all very difficult, very stupid. But the truth is, I'm not Leek. I'm Priam. Why? That's impossible. Priam's dead. No. It's Leek that's dead. That's Leek in there. Don't you understand? You're burying the wrong man. But he's dead. We've got to bury him. We can't just leave him out, you know. But not in the Abbey. I am the one to be buried in the Abbey, not Leek. Me! Why, now, no need for excitement, old boy. Well, I realize it's not an easy situation to explain. Oh, why, nonsense is the most natural thing on earth for a man to want to be buried in Westminster Abbey. But after all, don't you think it would be better if you died first? You see, when Leek died, the doctor thought it was I who was dead. If you'll excuse me for just a second, please. We've got to get a policeman quickly. This man is unhinged. Policeman? Now, that's all right. Just be calm. But now, now, don't you touch him. Don't you dare. Why, you ruddy fool. Run, Herbert, run. I'll sell my life dearly, I warn you. Police! 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 Help! Police! What's the matter? That man. The man with the, with the white beard. He's absolutely insane. Stop that man, somebody! Quickly, please, drive on. Stop, Gabby! Please! Excuse please. me, sir, but where did you want to go? Anywhere, it doesn't matter. Would you mind repeating that, sir? I'm a bit hard of hearing. Thank heaven for that. Very good, sir. Thank you, sir. Me. Uh, funny, ain't you? Have you a card? No, but I, I'm a member of Mr. Fall's household. Sorry, you can't pass without a card. Stand back, please. Step back, please. You don't understand.
man whose gentle spirit, whose understanding heart, whose warm, tender human sympathy lingers like a soft glow in the memory of those who loved him, whose work reflects the beauty and the glory of that great tormented soul. His hat, he says. He was up in the organ loft, howling like an hound right in the middle of the service. How he got there, nobody knows. Howling in the abbey, eh? Now, what about that, my man? Well, I'm very sorry. Well, he's drunk, if you ask me. Well, nobody asked you. All right, then. Let's have a smell of your breath. I am not drunk, but I have the slightest intention of permitting you to smell my breath. What's going on here? Howling like an hound in the organ loft, sir. Drunk and disorderly in the abbey during service. I am not drunk, I tell you. What's your name? My name. You have one, haven't you? No. At least not one that I care to give at the moment. All right, then. Let's go along quietly. Well, I've broken no law. In that case, no harm will come to you now. Just be easy. Good morning, Mr. Leake. You'll pardon me, madam. Is the service over? Stand aside, please. This man is... I'm speaking to Mr. Leake, if you don't mind. This man was drunk and disorderly in the Abbey during the service. How oh, silly. The... Mr. Leake doesn't drink. He was simply overcome, I expect. And no wonder with such a loss. Thank you, madam. And what loss was that, if I may ask? My goodness, don't tell me you don't know who he is. Well, who is he? Mr. Farrell's valley. For 25 years with Mr. Farrell, literally depending upon him for every thought and wish. For 25 years, Mr. Farrell never made a move, never a decision. Never had a thought without first talking it over with Mr. Leake. But he had no ticket. Then more shame on them after the best years of his life, giving every satisfaction. And what is his reward? No ticket. But why didn't you tell me, sir? I'm very sorry. Mr. Leake is a very shy man. He's not accustomed to policemen. Oh, I should think not. Well, I'm very sorry, sir. There was no harm meant. Would you like us to take you back to the organ loft? No, sir. No, thank you. I think well, it's quite all right, sir. You go right along with the lady. Thank you, Sergeant. Not at all. I think we'd better get you a new hat. I'd like a hat, a bowler. Uh, very good, sir. What size? A seven and a half. Very good, sir. Oh, dear. Now, may I ask? Ooh, two moles. That's very lucky, you know. Is it? Didn't you ever notice them? Of course. As a small boy, my view was not impeded by a beard. <laughs> Here you are, sir. Allow me, sir. Doesn't it seem a little bit small to you? Well, you said seven and a half, sir. Yes, but... Uh... All seven and a half, sir, are the same size, sir. Of course, if you don't know your own size, sir. Oh, yes. This is my size, all right. Seven and a half. Oh, well, in that case... Mr. Sir. Leake doesn't like this size. He doesn't like this style. He doesn't like this color. He doesn't like this hat. Now, will you get out some others, please? Why, certainly, madam. isn't it? Uh, yes. What is that? That, madam, is the name of the selection the orchestra is playing. Well, not much nourishment in that. Will you order for me? Anything at all? The order... waiter. He'll be back. I suppose so. I saw those prices. Did you? Are you sure you can afford it? Oh, yes, of course. 
Did they give you your month? My month? You were entitled to it, you know, no matter what happened. Oh, yes. I was provided for in the will. It doesn't matter. I simply don't want it to be extravagant for my sake. There's no call for it. I'm just as I am, just as you see me now. And no amount of foolish spending would affect me one way or the other. You understand, don't you? Oh, yes, certainly. Would you be good enough now to tell me how you recognized me? Oh, you're very like your photograph. Am I? I knew you at once. By the beard, of course, and also your shyness. It's very good, don't you think? I love it. Waiter. Waiter. Mr. Leake is speaking to you. Yes, ma'am. Such prices are scandalous. When you think that in Putney, a good housekeeper can keep everything going on 10 shillings a head a week. I don't believe I've ever been in Putney before. And for such food. Soul, they said. That was no more soul than this glove's soul. And if it had been cooked a minute, it had been cooked an hour and waiting. Really? I thought it was quite nice. For anyone who hasn't been used to good cooking, perhaps. You haven't told me yet, but I fancy you've never been married, have you? No, I haven't. You've always lived like this, just traveling about with no home and nobody to take care of you properly. One gets accustomed to it. Yes, I can understand that. No responsibilities. I can understand that, too. But I do feel sorry for you. All these years. It won't take a moment. The tea things are all ready. Thank you. It isn't Buckingham Palace, but it's been quite big enough for myself alone. And I dare say... Sit down, won't you? I think you'll find this chair comfortable. Have you your pipe? Would you like to smoke? You don't mind? Mind? Dear me, no. How else could a man be happy without his pipe and tobacco? Now, if you'll just sit and relax, I'll have the tea ready in a jiffy. The truth of the matter is, Priam Fall was not a happy man. I suppose not, poor soul. All that he wanted, actually, was to paint and to be left alone. But that didn't seem to be possible in London which he really loved very deeply. For instance, Priam Fall, God rest his great tormented soul, would never have been allowed to enjoy such a day as this. A painter, my dear Alice, is essentially a simple fellow, a workman, and he should live as such, enjoying the frugal wages, the coarse comforts, and the humble pleasures of the honest craftsman. Priam Fall would have loved this. Well, it all just goes to show. And what does it all just go to show, my dear? Well, they all said if I wrote to a matrimonial bureau, I'd be cheated. I beg your pardon? But I'm like you. If you want to get married, it's no use pretending you don't. There's no shame in wanting to get married. It's sensible and it's normal. And in such a case, a matrimonial bureau is a good and useful thing. You thought so evidently, and so do I. And I'm sure... If anything comes of this, I'll pay the fee with the greatest of pleasure. What about you? With the greatest of pleasure. Paper 
Oh, thank you, my dear. Where do you think you'll stroll today? I don't know. Perhaps down by the river. Will you be passing the fishmongers? That's a good idea. How about a bit of card? See what's nice. Card might go very well tonight. Anything you wish. Good morning, Hibbert. Good morning, Mr. Lee. Ah, oh, that's for Mrs. Lee. Well, mind the crossings, Henry. Not half bad, eh? Not half. Good morning, Aylmer. Good morning, Mr. Leake. An ounce of the usual, if you please, and my impedimenta, if it's not too much trouble. The impedimenta, eh? Mr. Leake draws, but he doesn't want the missus to know anything about it, so he always leaves his things here. That's right. Tell him nothing. It's not that exact there. It's simply, well, certain explanations, you know. Tell him nothing. That's my motto. Oh, there's no harm in a bit of drawing, as long as it's held under control. Do you know where the danger comes in, Mr. Leake? Danger in drawing? It comes in this way. A man starts to draw. First, he draws a tree, or an ocean, or something else, dead. Then, he goes past the dead stuff, and what does he draw? He draws a dog, or a cat, or a horse. But that's not the end. The next thing you know, he wants to draw a woman. Ah. First, with her clothes on, and then, Well, uh, thank you very much. Just be on your guard. That's all, sir. He's right. Never tell him a ruddy thing. going to keep us out, not likely. Right in, Mother. Now. Where is he? Never mind where who is. Who are you and what do you mean by smashing into this house like that? Who are we, she asks. Yes, who are you? Uh, I'm his wife, Mum. I'm the rightful Mrs. Henry Leake. Did you have a nice stroll? Excellent, excellent. To get the fish? Oh, yes, a very nice piece. We have visitors, Henry. Visitors? We? Old friends, they say. Don't you recognize her? I'm afraid you have the advantage, madam. Thirty years does change a person's appearance. What is this? You two talk it over while I get another cup. No, 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 you stay here. I'll be right back. Never mind that, you stay here with me. Of course, dear. Sit down, everybody. I'm not so sure I care to sit down with father. Father! Be it. She says she's your wife, dear, and her sons. Your sons, too, if you don't mind, sir. Great heavens. You? Impossible. It's the beard, of course. And you're heavier, but your eyes. Oh, your eyes, my son. Continue, Mother. I never saw this wound before in my whole life. Then how do you explain this, sir? Let father see it also. Will you kindly stop referring to me as your father?
This means nothing whatever to me. I suppose you will not deny that your name is Henry Leak. I deny everything. No matter what you say, I deny it. Is that clear? Are you sure you recognize my husband? Well, I can't say I recognize him as he was, no more than he recognizes me after 30 years. He was only 22 or 3 when I saw him last, and clean-shaven at that. But he's the same sort of man. And his eyes, oh, they're the same. Madam, will you kindly examine my nose? Presumably, you should recognize it. Do you? Uh, Go on, look closely. Uh, Do you? Well, I can't say as I remember it being so bony. Can a man change his nose? A nose might change with the years. All flesh is grass. The discussion does not concern grass. This woman does not recognize my nose. But you were valid with a gentleman named Mr. Priam Fall, the painter, weren't you? Yes. Well, that's what my husband was doing last time I heard of him. To repeat, I not only deny everything that has been said, but also everything that will be said. Now, with your permission. Will you? Oh, oh dear! Oh, oh how could oh, I be oh, so oh, clumsy, oh, oh, Henry, oh, get me a cloth from the kitchen. Hurry. Oh, dear. Oh, oh, oh. Yes, sir. Dries off in a jiffy. Oh, dear. Tea? Yes. How many sugars? Two sugars. I say, isn't he coming back? Who? Father. I shouldn't think so. I imagine he's gone for a stroll. He usually does after tea. But that's quite strange in the very midst of the discussion. He's rather a peculiar man. He has his good points. As he's not here, I can speak candidly. He also has other points. Yes. How true. Sit down, won't you? When you spoke of his cruelty, I understand. Far be it from me to say a word against him. He's often very kind to me, but... There's no denying. You mean that it... Once he twisted my arm terribly. And one morning he snatched a hot iron out of my hand. Don't, please. I know all that you can tell me. I know because I've been through. He threatened you with a hot iron, too. If threatening were only all. Then he's not changed in all these years. You know, sometimes I don't think he's quite right in the head. I seldom get up in the morning without thinking, well, perhaps today you'll have to be taken off. Taken off? To the asylum. Oh. I'm sorry for you two. What do you mean? You're his sons. It's the same blood. I should watch myself very closely if I were you. Oh, I see. You want him back, of course, because you have first claim on him. Yes, of course, and... Well, if you can persuade him to go, if you can make him see his duty, you're welcome. Oh, he wouldn't have to go. Mother could come here. Oh, but this isn't his house. It's mine. And the furniture. He's got nothing at all, I'm afraid. The fact is, he should be prosecuted for bigamy. That's what ought to be done. Oh, by all means, you're quite right. It might be quite expensive, detectives and lawyers and all that sort of thing. Oh, but the Crown, the, the prosecution would pay for all that. Then there's no reason why he shouldn't be in prison at once, whatever the expense. Although you're... you're students, aren't you? Honor students at the seminary. Oh, but I don't suppose that would matter particularly to your standing a father in prison for bigamy, would it? Let's clear out of here.
What on earth? Are they gone? Hours ago. Oh, why did you go out without your hat and coat? You'll catch your death. Alice, I give you my word of honor. I never laid eyes on that woman before in my life. Of course not. And besides, she's a nagging woman. Anybody could see that, and I don't blame you for a second. But darling, I tell you, I never saw her before. Don't you believe me? Of course, dear. Only I hope there won't be any more of them. Great Scott. So do I. More trouble in Ireland. If you ask my opinion, the Irish are a bit difficult to get along with. Ever since I was a small boy, without one hair on my face, I have been reading about more trouble in Ireland. I'm an old man, broken down with sin and a petrified liver. Oh, we should take a look at this, Henry. It came this morning, and it's business, and of course I can't be bothered with that sort of thing in the morning. Did you put sugar in my coffee? Yes, you forgot to stir it. Cahoon Brewery Company, eh? That's where I have my money. Dear shareholder, owing to a lamentable temperance wave which has been sweeping the country, the Board of Governors of Cahoon's Brewery Company Limited decided at its annual meeting yesterday not to declare its customary dividend on ordinary shares. Respectfully yours, H.Y. Walker, Chairman. What are they up to now? Well, what it means in ordinary words is they're not declaring a dividend this year. Oh, but Henry, that's quite out of the question. I have to have my dividend, and by May, too. That's what it says, anyway. Henry, this is terrible. Now, how on earth could a brewery have financial trouble? Look at the beer that people drink, buckets of it. Well, I myself must have put away several hundred thousand gallons of it. That's what Father used to say. Put your faith in an Englishman's thirst, it is gold in the bank, he said. Everything we had was in brewery shares. Well, after all, there's still my two pounds a week. Bless your heart, darling. I need more than that. It's the payment on the house, and it's due in May. <laughs> but I'm simply not going to worry about it now. I've no patience with worrying. When the time comes, I said I'd make pastry after supper, and I will. See if I don't. That's the spirit, old girl. Don't you think it's time to shut the windows and come to bed? But about this payment, if we can't meet it, does it mean that we'll have to get out of this house? There are other houses, Henry. Not for me. This is the house I like. This is the house I'm happy in. I don't want to change. Well, it's a month yet. Perhaps something will happen It usually does. There's a way you know that I could earn some money. If you think I'll consider your taking another situation, you're greatly mistaken, let me tell you right now. Situation. I don't want you in service again. Oh, no. There's another way. But it involves a certain measure of risk. Nothing crooked, Henry. I was thinking of painting. No, no, darling. You're much too old to go climbing up and down ladders. I never have a moment's peace. Not houses. Pictures. Come on to bed, love. You're getting tired. Alice. More coffee? Not now, thank you. Last night I told you that I was thinking of painting again. Now, now, dear. No, no, no. Let me talk, please. There's something I've got to tell you. A certain explanation. Will you sit down? The truth of the matter is that my name isn't Henry Leake. Oh, isn't it? But what does it matter? As long as you haven't committed a murder or anything. My real name is Priam Fowle. Fowle? Wasn't that your gentleman's name? Well, that's what I want to explain. You see, it was my valet who sent you the photograph. His name was Henry Leake. He's dead now. I don't understand. Well, it's really quite simple. It was Leake who fell ill and died. But the doctor made a mistake, and I didn't correct him because, oh, well, there were all sorts of reasons. One, I didn't want to be Priam Fowle anymore. In fact, I was downright sick of being prior fall. I tell you this so that you'll understand that when I say I can paint and make a little money, I'm not being altogether foolish. Then it's this Henry Leake that's buried in Westminster Abbey instead of you. That's the somewhat quaint fact. And you've never said a word about this to anybody? Not to anybody who'd listen. Do you know what? What? You've been worrying too much. Worrying? Of course I've been worrying. I've been happy in this house. Henry, love, it was sweet of you to tell me all about it. And I understand the whole thing. 
Do you know what I would do if I were you? I am not a loony, if that's what you've got in your mind. If I were you, I would never again mention a word of this to anybody. I'd just forget it. But it's the truth. And above all, you should try to stop worrying. But blast it all, Alice. All right, I'll prove it to you. Henry, love, I'm not questioning it. All I'm saying is that it doesn't matter. No, I'm going to prove it to you. Come on. I'm going to settle this matter right now. I do not intend to go through life being regarded as foolish Phil, the village idiot. But Henry... It happens I have incontrovertible evidence of my true identity. You come into the attic. Stand here. There. Did you do that? I did. How does it strike you? It's beautiful. What is it? Study it. Why, that's Putney Bridge, isn't it? It is. On rather a peculiar day, I imagine. But it's very nice, Henry. Very nice indeed. Quite nice. Uh, no, 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 no. No nearer. Well, if you don't want me to see it close. But you are at just the right distance. It, you know, it's a pity you didn't put an omnibus on the bridge. There is an omnibus on the bridge. Oh. There. It stopped, I suppose. Yes, dead still. But it's very nice, Henry. I suppose you learned from your... Isn't that the Elk public house down in the corner? It is. I thought I recognized it, and a very good likeness, too. Would it surprise you to know that that canvas is worth, at the very least, 800 pounds? Yes. To say nothing of the rumpus in Bond Street, if it became known that Priam Farr was painting in a Putney attic instead of rotting in Westminster Abbey. What a row that'd be. Henry Love, don't you realize that you can get real pictures of lakes and even mountains by real artists for two pounds a piece at the frame makers? Two pounds? Dash it, Alice, I've got 1,500 pounds for things not nearly as good as that. Darling, I don't want you worrying like this. We'll get the money some way. Please don't worry. Listen, Alice. But no matter what happens, I'll always take care of you. No matter what. <laughs> Come on, get your hat and coat. I'll never let them take you away. Come on. I'm going to prove this thing to you if it's my last act. Good day, sir. Good day, ma'am. Good day. I have a painting here. I want you to tell me what you think of it. Well, I could hardly claim to be an expert, sir. Well, you're familiar with pictures, aren't you? Yes, sir, but... Uh... I ask where you got it? No. Hmm. Uh, well, it's very good. Is it a copy? Is it? Either a copy or a very good imitation. Would you be good enough to put a price on it? Hmm. Uh, two pounds? What? Five. Oh. Uh, ten, sir? Uh, you mean that you'll give ten pounds for it? Yes. That'll be all, thank you. Oh, but Henry. Come along, my love. Just a minute, sir. Fifteen, sir. Fifteen pounds, Henry. Do you suppose he's crazy? Mad as a mock. Is it necessary for you to consider everybody who is connected with the arts as crazy?
it's me. How do you do, Lady Vale? Good morning, Oxford. I'm pleased to see you looking so well. Ah, rubbish. You have another fall, I believe. It arrived only yesterday. Oh. A beautiful example. Observe the composition. I'll take it. I congratulate you, my lady. How much? Would you say that, uh, 2,500 pounds was unreasonable? I would, but I'll pay it. That's it. You like it, Benson? Yes, my lady. That's one of the new motor omnibuses, you know. Is it? Yes, my lady. My daughter, the one that married the tram conductor. She rode it the first trip last winter. Did she really? The first trip, did you say? Last New Year's Day, my lady. My daughter rode it all the way to Putney. Surely you must be mistaken, Benson. Mistaken, my lady? This last New Year's Day? January 1st, 1908. <laughs> Lady Vale understands, I trust, that I'm prepared to return the money to the last shilling. It is not a question of the money, Mr. Oxford. Lady Vale regards herself as the victim of a swindle so outrageous that a far greater satisfaction is to be demanded. In the course of the past year, she has paid to you 42,000 pounds for 21 paintings represented to her as the work of Priam Fowl. Chemical tests of the paint and canvas now have they shown these... They are the work of Priam Fowl, Mr. Pennington. I insist on that. Mr. Oxford, tell me, when did Priam Fowl die? Priam Fowl is not dead. Then why did they bury him? He's not dead, and he's not been buried. There's been some incredible mistake. In that case, of course, you'll be prepared to produce him in court if, and I say if, mark you, you can dig him up. Good day, sir. Good day. Mr. Oxford, how do you do? Mr. Stolle, I'm afraid I must insist upon further information regarding the paintings you've been bringing to me. Uh, well, uh, all I know is that it's been Mrs. Leake who's brought the paintings to me, and uh, apparently she doesn't want her husband to know about them. Henry. Yes? Yeah? There's a gentleman for you at the front door. What? Have I the pleasure of addressing Mr. Henry Leake? Yes. Oh, allow me. My card. Darling, may I present Mr. Clive Oxford? I am honored, Mrs. Leake. Likewise. The distinguished work, Mr. Leake. Truly distinguished. Thank you. The work of a master. Your stature continues to grow with each succeeding work. With each succeeding work? I will give you 2,000 pounds for it. For sale, thank you. Three. It is not for sale. Four. I have told five. you. Five. This is insanity, of course. But under the circumstances, I suppose so. 
I don't in the least regard it as insanity. Do you suppose I might have a pen? Thank you. How much more work is there to be done on this? I'll finish it tomorrow, I suppose. Well, there's no hurry, really. So why don't you do me the honor of visiting my gallery now? I have several pictures I'd very much like you to see. I will someday. Oh, why not now? It might be very much to your advantage, Mr. Leake. All right. Splendid. I should especially like your opinion on a prime fowl I picked up recently. opinion is one of the finest fowls in existence. What do you think? It may be. Vermeer, Delacroix, Gainsborough. What other modern could hold his own in such distinguished company? I don't know, I'm sure. I've been offered 5,000 pounds for it. What did you pay for it? 20 pounds. Come into my office and I'll explain to you my rather peculiar difficulties. Oh, I shouldn't like to bore you, of course. On the contrary, I assure you. Your coat? Oh, sit down, please. Thank you. Cigar? Thank you. Now, when did you paint it, Mr. Fowle? You are insane. No, I don't think so. Possibly I should be with the trouble that faces me, but I'm not. Trouble? About a year ago, a man named Storley, a frame maker from Putney, came to me with a picture which I at once recognized as the work of Priam Fowle. Was it signed? Yes. Oh, but not with a name, if that's what you mean. To me, to any connoisseur, Priam Fowl could not put a brush to canvas without signing it indelibly with his genius. So, of course, I bought it for 20 pounds. And how much did you get for it? <laughs> Under the circumstances, I have no objection to telling you. I got 2,000 pounds for it. Altogether, I bought some 30-odd fowls from the man, for which I received a total of some 60,000 pounds. Art, I see, is a very profitable business for the dealer. In this case, can also be quite profitable for the artist. What do you mean? Well, now that I've found him, I shall be delighted to pay him his share. A matter of some 30,000 pounds, shall we say. In other words, you've been caught. Well, there is an action, yes. Lady Vale, who bought a great number of the paintings, found that some of them had been painted since 1905. Splendid. I hope she wins. This is not a time for facetiousness, Mr. Fowle. Leak, if you please. Henry Wadsworth Leak. Mr. Leak, Mr. Fowle, whichever you choose to call yourself, you may as well understand now that I have no intention whatever of standing idly by while the Oxford galleries are destroyed through some fantastic error in Westminster Abbey. Whoever it was they buried there, it was not Priam Fowle. For I have this very day seen Priam Fowle painting as only Priam Fowle could paint. You dare question the Abbey? I would question the Crown before seeing my business destroyed. How long, may I ask, have you been under this odd delusion? So far as the paintings are concerned, I have never been under any delusions. Mr. Oxford, I can hardly find words to express my warm satisfaction in your misfortune. You have swindled your customer. You have swindled the frame maker. You have swindled the artist who painted the pictures. And worst of all, you have swindled the memory of that magnificent genius whose dust lies today in Valhalla. For that last, I can never forgive you. You're not going to deny that you're Priam Fowl. Do you? No. You're much too clever for me to try that. But if you think for one moment that I'm going to admit it to anyone else, if you think that I'm going to sacrifice my peace and happiness 
simply to save your wretched hide and bank book, you're mistaken. For in my opinion, sir, you're a thoroughgoing, double-dyed, triple-plated rogue and scoundrel. And I wouldn't lift one little finger to save you from frying in perdition for the remainder of eternity. Good day, sir. Mr. Fowl. Leak, sir. Leak. Henry Greenleaf, leak. Sorry, Prime. You thought that I was dead, didn't you? I thought you weren't quite well. I shouldn't have done it, I suppose. But there were those pictures, 15 pounds apiece, and you did nothing with them. Just finished them, threw them in cupboards, and never looked at them again. I never thought of it. I didn't want you worrying about money. You're a dear girl. What's going to become of it? Nothing. He's going to be sued, and in all probability, he will go to prison, I hope. But I told him flatly I'd have nothing to do with it. Do you realize he was making 10,000% profit on my work? 10,000%? By George, I had no idea percentages ran that high. I should have known. You've always been so much the gentleman, so useless. I wouldn't throw a pot of tea on him if he were on fire at my feet. Alice, there's no reason for this to make any difference, of course. No. Why should it? I don't know. I'm not sure. I wish I could be. What do you mean? Something to wonder about. As Mrs. Henry Leake, it's been very cozy the way I am, the way we've lived here in Putney. We've been quite happy, I believe. I can't think of any other woman who might have suited you better. There'll be no change, dear. Oh, but there's bound to be Henry. Or rather, Prime, I should say. I've told you, I have no intention whatever of getting mixed up in this business. As Mrs. Prime Farrell, the wife of a great gentleman, so great that he could be buried in Westminster Abbey. I don't know. I don't know how I'd be. Not much, I expect. Like I couldn't be a duchess or a bareback rider. I can't feel that I'd be much use to you anymore. This is the most ridiculous rot you've ever uttered. I might be uncomfortable or too ignorant, but I couldn't stand that. I'd hate to lose you because it's been so nice together. But it'd do no good if either of us was unhappy about it. But I'm not going to worry about that now. We could go away to Borneo or someplace like that. No, no, Henry. Putney's my home. I'm afraid I'm a bit too old to think of living in a tree. Very well. We'll stay right here in Putney. You do want that, don't you? More than anything else on Earth. This is where I was happy at last. This is where I want to live and die. This is my home now, too. We'll see. to be buried in Westminster Abbey? No, dear, you didn't. All I asked was peace and quiet, to be allowed to live in tranquility with my wife and paint a picture now and then. But no, two persons who I already loathe engage in a quarrel which I have no concern, and my life is made unbearable. Why? I don't know. Of course you don't know. I don't even expect you to answer. It's just a dramatic way of expressing my exasperation with the entire affair. You 
are the fellow, aren't you? Mr. Fall to you. Good morning, Mr. Fall. Leak to you. You must be polite, Henry. I hate them all, and I haven't the slightest intention in the world of being polite. May it please your ludship, and gentlemen of the jury, this is an action brought by Lady Vale to recover the sum of 42,000 pounds paid by her to Mr. Clive Oxford for 21 paintings fraudulently represented to her as the work of the late Priam Fowle, whose remains lie today in the hallowed halls of Westminster Abbey. But the possible consequences involved here are so monstrous that I shudder to contemplate them. Does an imposter, a valet, a servant rest within the sacred precincts of the British Valhalla? That is the contention of the defendant. They would have you believe, my lud and gentlemen, that Priam Fowl, far from being dead, lives today in this very court in the person of a certain mysterious bearded fellow whom it will be my pleasure to unmask here as a charlatan, a rogue, a swindler, and a grave robber. But first, we will hear from the experts on art. Will the experts for the plaintiff please stand? With your permission, my lad, will the experts for the defendant please stand? Is there anyone in this court who is not an expert? Then I said, I take it that uh, you were Mr. Files' valet. And what did he answer to that? He said, uh, yes, sir, I was. Is that the man to whom you spoke? Uh, yes, uh, that is the man. Now, how did you first meet your husband, madam? Through a matrimonial agency. Who first had recourse to this agency? I did. What was your object? What do people usually go to a matrimonial agency for? You are not here to ask the questions, madam, but to answer them. I simply thought you should have known that. I went to a matrimonial agency because I wanted a husband. How's that? Do you think appealing to a matrimonial agency was quite a nice thing to do? What do you mean by nice? Womanly, if you prefer. And do you think that asking a rude and unnecessary question like that is quite the gentlemanly thing to do? Silence! <laughs> Order the court! Madam, I have already reminded you. Under what name did this man write to you? Leek. Under what name did he marry you? Leek. Under what name have you lived with him since that marriage? Leek. Then in your opinion, what is his name? I can't tell you. You mean you don't know? Oh, certainly I know. But you refuse to say. That's it. My lad, will you please instruct the witness to answer the question? May I ask, madam, why you refuse to answer? Politeness, I should say. I'm afraid I don't understand. I feel, my lord, that it would be a bit impudent of me to say who my husband is, when the whole object of this trial is to decide that for me. <laughs> <laughs> then you definitely recognize the man in the coffin, the man they interred in Westminster Abbey, as your cousin? Definitely. You weren't on especially good terms with your cousin, were you, Mr. Fowle? We had one little tip, uh, yes. How long did it last? Oh, about uh, 45 years, I believe. <laughs> you remember the occasion for this little disagreement? As rather small boys, we had a fight over a plum cake. And what was the result of this sanguinary encounter? He loosened one of my teeth. What did you do to him? Pardon me, my lord. I tore off some of his clothes. You remember a thing like that after 45 years? Oh, yes, I remember it very well. I remember... You remember what, Mr. Fowle? I'm not sure that I care to say it in mixed company. With his lordship's permission, perhaps you'll whisper it to me.
Where were these moles? Right here, there. Two of them. On the left collarbone? Approximately. Were these moles close together? Oh, uh, about uh, so far, as I recall. As you remember it, was there anything in any way distinctive about these moles? No. No, just moles, I should say. Just plain everyday moles. <clears throat> was either of them hirsute? I beg your pardon? Pursued. Do you see the gentleman whom the defendant in this case offers as triumphal? Yes. He is hirsute. Oh. oh, oh, you mean crazy. No, hairy. Hirsute means hairy. Was either of these moles hairy? Oh, no, no. No, 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 no. These moles were, uh, <clears throat> uh, oh, uh, quite clean shaven. <laughs> <laughs> What is your name? Priam Fall. Priam Fall. Take the book in your right hand. The evidence you will give to the court shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. Kiss the book. Will you give the court your name? Priam Fall. Are you sure it isn't Henry Leak? Very well. It's Henry Leak. But which is it? Either. Well, what are you known as? Bolt. Uh, Mr. Leak. Farl is the correct name, my lord. Oh, very well, Mr. Farl. Aren't you interested in a just and equitable solution of this action? I can't honestly say that I am, my lord. But you're under oath. I realize that, my lord. And if I so much as hinted that I cared tuppence what happened to either of these miserable money changers, I should be guilty of the most outrageous perjury. Henry. Very well, my dear. You may continue if you wish. Now, Mr. Duncan Fowle has testified that as a small boy he fought with his cousin Priam. You would, of course, remember that. I fought with him many times and defeated him on each and every occasion. During one of these battles, he observed that Mr. Priam Fowle had two small moles on his body. Have you any such moles, Mr. Leek? I have. You have? I have. Where? Here. Go on. Ask him. Then, of course, uh, you will be good enough to show your moles to the court. No, I will not. What? I said, no, I will not. You have two such moles, but you refuse to show them? Precisely. You understand, of course, that the jury will draw its own conclusions from such a statement? Naturally. Now, perhaps you prefer to show them just to Mr. Pennington and myself. No, I would not prefer to do that either. Mr. Fowl, don't you think just the four of us might retire to my private room? No, my lord, but thank you. Couldn't you let your collar down just a bit? Not an inch. Might I ask the reason for your obstinate attitude? Because, my lord, I have testified under oath that my body is afflicted with the moles as described. That, I believe, should be sufficient, since no sane man would claim moles if he didn't have them. But <laughs> under the circumstances... I'm sorry, my lord, but I believe that I'm well within my legal rights in protesting any further effort on the part of this court to compel me to disrobe either in part or in whole. The court promises you every consideration for your private sensibilities. But pardon me, my lord. It happens in this particular instance that the moles are situated in a relatively decorous precinct of my anatomy. But suppose they were not so favorably located. Would I still be importuned to unclothe myself publicly if the moles were... <laughs> Excuse me, Mr. Registrar. Adjourn the court. Well, I'm afraid...
afraid he's right. Under the common law, there's no provision whatever for removing a witness's collar against his will. 42,000 pounds hinges upon two mysterious moles, which, of course, he has, but he won't show. And the law says we can do nothing about it. It's no use, you know. What can they do? They'll call you back to the stand and simply ask you if I've got the moles. And if I tell them? The case is over. It's goodbye to Putney. It's goodbye to peace and quiet and happiness. It's goodbye to everything. Goodbye to me. Will Mrs. Henry Leake step into the witness box? The name is Farrell, if you don't mind. Not you, madam. The first Mrs. Leake, if you don't mind. Just Mrs. Leake, will you take the witness box, please? <laughs> Rest of you back to your seats. What is your name? Mrs. Henry Leake. Mrs. Henry Leake, take the book in your right hand. The evidence you will give to the court shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. Kiss the book. Your name, please? Mrs. Henry Leake. When were you married, Mrs. Leake? June 12, 1875. May I ask, where is your husband now? Him. You mean this man with the beard? Well, he didn't have a beard when I married him. That's something new he picked up. <laughs> but are you positive that this is the man? Oh, yes, that's my Henry, all right. Mrs. Leake, will you please tell the court whether this man, your husband, the father of these three manly sons had any bodily disfigurements? Pardon? Had he any birthmarks? No, sir. Think well, Mrs. Leake. Had he any, say, moles? I submit your lordship that that is a leading question. But, my lord, the subject has already been submitted. That has no bearing whatever, my lord. The effort to lead the witness is obvious. Perhaps you can phrase your question differently, Mr. Pennington. Did your husband have any distinctive... You mean moles? Yes. Did he have any moles? Where? Anywhere. <laughs> no, sir. None at all, is that right? No, sir, not one. Mr. Henry Leake's skin was as smooth as velvet. Often used to say to him, Henry, I said, your skin is like... <laughs> <laughs> That'll be enough, Mrs. Leake. You have answered the question quite satisfactorily. Is that all? Just one more question. Have you ever been divorced from this man? No, sir. Then legally, he is still your husband. Yes, sir. Just a moment, Mrs. Leake. Alice, if you've anything to say, Mr. Starr, will you step into the witness box, please? Don't go, Mrs. Leake. You have some additional testimony to give, Mrs. Farr? Yes. Prime, come here. My lad, I protest such an irregularity. Oh, don't be a stick. Now wait, Alice. Hold still, dear. He's very shy, you know. Now, if you'll just hold your beard up a bit, dear. Can you see Mrs. Leake? Smooth as velvet, eh? Are they real?
Chops with crocodile sauce. Excellent. Excellent, my dear. 